Mr. Black and in this video I'm going to be discussing the King Island UFO incident and then after that I'll talk about the Neil Orem cat entity case. You're sitting in your car waiting for the sun to rise. Suddenly you see a light in the sky. You realize pretty quickly that this isn't any kind of conventional craft that you are aware of. And even worse, it's coming straight for you. What do you do? This is a question an Australian man was forced to ask himself in 1976. His encounter received some mainstream media attention and has become known in UFO circles as the King Island UFO incident. On April 10, 1976, a King Island man, who asked to remain anonymous, had driven to a wild and uninhabited part of the coastline near Whistler Point, a bird watching area in Yamakuna, Australia. It was early in the morning, still quite dark. At sunrise, he planned to head down to the shore and commence his morning of duck hunting. He had been waiting in his vehicle for some 10 minutes when, at around 5.30 a.m., he looked off in a northeasterly direction and observed a beam of light. He initially assumed it was from a powerful flashlight or a motorcycle headlight. It was moving in a westerly direction across the brow of a hill less than half a mile away. This puzzled the man as he was familiar with the terrain and the area was interspersed by broken shafts on each side and there was no trackway which would permit free movement in that area. Even stranger, he could not make out any sound of a motor. He also had the impression of some type of object, something, moving behind and with the light. As he continued to watch, the object suddenly turned in his direction. He was amazed the beam of light was bigger and much more solid than he had originally thought. He began to make out the source of the light. It seemed to be some type of craft in the shape of a cross. It was about the size of a small plane, maybe smaller. The object appeared to come down and began following the terrain down the hill in the hunter's direction. It was moving at a steady pace and seemed to be maintaining a fixed altitude above the ground. As it approached, the object emitted an inverted cone of bright orange light at its extremities of a different degree of brightness. The hunter realized that it would soon be on top of him, and he became admittedly unnerved as he was certain this wasn't any kind of conventional aircraft that he was aware of. He sensed that it was attracted by his car, so he immediately climbed out and began running towards the other side of the small hill from which he was parked. He laid down on the grass under the cover of darkness as the object approached. He had a pretty good view of the cone of light, which he estimated to be about 30 yards or 90 feet across at its base, and about 60 yards or 180 feet from its base to its source. The object continued its forward approach for about a minute or less, then it suddenly reversed its direction and moved back in a direct line from which it had come eventually disappearing over the skyline. The hunter claims that at no point did he hear any noise coming from the craft. It was completely silent. Although spooked by the encounter, the man elected to remain at the spot until dawn, though his morning of planned duck hunting was ultimately abandoned. He thought about staying quiet about his encounter, though his curiosity got the better of him. He was interested to find out if any other people had seen the same object that Saturday morning, so he contacted the King Island newspaper. His account was printed in the April 14, 1976 edition. I have made at least two videos in which drivers described encountering an object either following them or in the road. Rather than remain out of sheer terror, they opted to flee their vehicle. In this hunter's case, the article seems to downplay his apprehension, though the fact that he actually felt compelled to exit his vehicle and hide suggests a high level of fear. And while no entities were observed in this particular case, it does seem as though, as the hunter believed, the craft took an interest in his car 
even changing direction and moving toward it. It only seemed to retreat when it got close enough to realize that nobody was inside. Given the shocking number of hunters who have gone missing under mysterious circumstances the past 100 years, this case makes me wonder, what would have become of this man had he elected to remain inside his car? Would he too have just become another entry in David Politis' Missing 411 series? Even more interesting is that the hunter in this case was parked near a body of water. Water seems to be a common factor in so many of these types of stories. Another point of interest is his description of the craft. He noted that it was, quote, cross-like, which differs from the usual saucer or triangle-shaped objects often described. What the significance of its shape means I have no idea, though I'm not aware of any cross-shaped conventional craft being flown now or in 1976. Neil Oram born January 2, 1938, is a British musician, poet, artist, film director, and playwright. He is best known for his 10-play cycle, The Warp, which was directed by Ken Campbell. Even those people who are familiar with this man and his work are probably not aware of the fact that in 1979, he and an actress named Maria Mustaka encountered something so bizarre that even 40 years later, they could not get the matter out of their mind. Neil wrote of the encounter which was published in 40 and Times magazine in June 2021. It was New Year's Day 1979. Neil Oram had just arrived in town. He was there to see Maria Mustaka, who was playing the lead in his play The War, which was set to open at London's Institute of Contemporary Arts the following day. Afterward, Maria and Neil went back to Mustaka's house. They were sitting together on her sofa, listening to music and looking out through her French windows into her garden. All of a sudden, Maria's cat went ballistic. According to Neil, the cat didn't so much as scream, but howled like a wolf. The feline ran full tilt out of the room, up the hallway into the bedroom, then back down the hallway, then back up the hallway, all while howling. Maria, unsure of what was going on, attempted to catch it, but it just clawed her and ran away, howling at the top of its little lungs. Maria told Neil that she'd never seen her cat behave that way before. Suddenly she gripped Neil's hand and shrieked. Neil followed her eyes towards the French windows. That is when he saw what Maria was looking at. It was a huge cat person alighted on the wall at the end of the garden. Not a big cat, but a cat person crouching, facing us from the top of the six foot high wall. Not exactly a human face, not exactly a cat face. Somehow I knew what it was. I felt spaced out but not afraid. It seemed to emanate a powerful, quiet ambience as it almost floated down into the garden. Neil noted that Maria was almost in shock, shaking and digging her nails into the palm of his hand. Neil stared at the cat person. He estimated that it was roughly five feet tall and covered in black fur. It started to walk upright towards them. As this elemental, utter strangeness approached the large French window, I could sense an invisibly steady, intense air pressure building up on the creature's side of the window. I thought the glass had cracked, but it was Maria's cat howling even more distraughtly. As Neil and Maria watched, the creature raised its palms, not paws. Neil was adamant about this. It raised its palms and they could see them pressed against the glass. Maria was so overwhelmed with fright that she actually passed out. Neil quickly shook her awake. He implored her to keep watching. It seemed to me that this jet black visitor was not familiar with windows. It kept its hands on the glass for 20 seconds, the demented cat still howling, then turned around and glided walk back to the wall and seemed to almost float back to a crouching position on the top of the wall. It turned around and looked in our direction, then seemed to be scanning all the way around, it turned its back to us and disappeared beyond the wall. 
At this point, Neil noted a strange silence that invaded the home. The trembling cat, now silent, settled into Maria's lap. Some 40 years later, prior to his writing of the experience for inclusion in Fortean Times, he and Maria revisited the sighting. Maria was now living in a different location, though one with a similar French window and garden. She could not recall if the creature they saw had a tail, and asked Neil if he could remember. Neil found it odd that he also could not recall. You would think a tail, or a lack of tail, would not be forgotten. But actually, actually, I don't think it's something we've forgotten, but a feature we failed to digest at the time. I have made numerous videos about cat people or upright walking cat-like creatures, though this one reminds me of a panther man case from Canada that I covered. That case seemed to be connected to the UFO phenomenon. While no UFO was observed here, there are some very notable high strangeness elements to Neil and Maria's sighting. From the erratic behavior of Maria's cat, to the way the cat-like creatures seem to glide or float rather than walk, to the strange silence that followed its departure. This silence, known as the Oz Effect, was coined by British ufologist Jenny Randalls, and is often described by people who have encountered a UFO or cryptid. Typically, cats do not react the way Maria's cat did unless it sensed an incredible amount of danger. While Neil himself did not feel afraid, at least not that he indicated, Maria was overcome with fear to the point of actually passing out. It is unclear what might have happened to Neil and Maria had the creature been able to actually get beyond the glass into the room they were standing in. Granted, there is also the possibility that it did and Maria and Neil are only remembering part of the experience, the rest of which, like whether or not it had a tail, had long been forgotten with the passage of time.